Hello and welcome everybody at the Open Infrastructure Orbit. Here you find all the different organizations that are involved with uh, open infrastructure. So we're very happy um, to also have Matthias and Katharina from the AFRA in Berlin here, um, who are working on Qualnet and they're talking about how you can do that in Rust. So thanks a lot that you're here and that's your applause. Um, yeah, Callnet is an internet-independent wireless mesh communication app. Um, that means that we try to communicate between the end user's devices directly in an interconnected way. So every device can, c can communicate with all the other devices it is connected to, and even further if the other device is connected to other. This has um, several um, upsides. One of the upsides is we, we build our own infrastructure. We are not dependent on the internet service providers. Um, we can also communicate if uh, the internet services and mobile services are shut down or if we don't want to go over them. The idea is to have a zero config, easily usable app. So multi-language, um, with a nice user interface. This is the version 1.0. Um, it's uh, cross-platform, it's easily installable on all the different platforms. Uh, we have written it for um, Linux, um, for Windows, for OS X, uh, for Android and for iPhone. And this all um, was written beautifully in uh, C and um, it uh, was used or is used um, all around the world. Um, it's a modular structure that goes even into the routers and uh, you can build a really modular networks that you can add and add and add new devices that extend. So, but there are some challenges. So, uh, we were using in the first version the so-called ad hoc or IBSS mode, which is dying and not use, usable in the devices anymore. We had over 400,000 lines of uh, C code, which was hard to maintain and yeah, people didn't like it too much how it was written. So, and uh, even our user interface, which was an HTML5 user interface, uh, got much too big and, and was really unstructured. So um, what is really important if we want to go kind of off the grid, if we want to be able to communicate with our devices is that our devices nowadays are um, the mobile devices and mobile devices don't have administrative rights. So to go to be um, mobile first, we need to go off of that, we cannot have administration rights. Um, we need to get rid of the ad hoc mode because it's not supported anymore. And we need to do user space routing. All right, uh, can you hear me? Great, I can hear myself so you can probably also hear me. Um, so um, I've been working on CallNet for a few years now. I started with, um, with a GSOC project uh, in 2016 doing new security stuff in the old code base. And uh, since then we've been thinking about how to restructure the code in a way that makes it more extensible and maintainable. Uh, the old code base, uh, you saw this diagram uh, with a bunch of boxes. In theory those existed, but in practice over time the you know the project has existed since 2012, modules started bleeding into each other and it became really not fun to work with. And so for the rewrite, we started thinking about the layers that we might want to have. Um, we have to replicate a lot of the work that is being done for us in dependencies such as OLSR in our own code and user space because we don't have the permissions to actually do these things with dependencies. And so coming from the bottom up, we had to think about network interfaces and the way that we we, the way that we interface our own code with whatever is there on a platform, uh, which is the, the bottom two modules that you can see in the stack. 
Uh, then we had to think about how to do actual routing. So if you have a network of multiple nodes, uh, how do you get a packet from A to B that has to go via C or D in the middle? On top of that, there is a whole bunch of stuff that we'll get into. Um, in this slide, it's only called the service API. And this has to do with, our, with the thought that we didn't want to just be one application anymore. CallNet is very useful, and it can be used to do a bunch of things. You can send messages. You can share files. You can uh, do voice calls over it. But fundamentally, it's still just a single application that people install, and then they do stuff with. And they're locked into whatever we come up with for use cases. And so both for a new architectural design and also to let other people extend this network, we thought about the concept of services. A service being an application that runs on a distributed mesh network uh, without any servers, without there being someone who hosts something uh, that can self-replicate through the network and let other people decide what they want to do on this infrastructure that everyone is building as a community. And so, that's the service API, which is the, I would say, core component of the new stuff that we've been writing and uh, something that we'll get into in a little bit. On top of that, we actually write some services ourselves. So we still do provide a messaging service, a basically decentralized Twitter, um, which at the moment, or has so far had a 140 character limit. I guess we have to up that now because Twitter is cool, I guess. Um, we also have file sharing, so you can announce a file to the network, and it sort of works like torrenting, um, where you, you don't have to immediately send your file out. You can sort of announce it to the network, and then people can get to you and, and get the file. And also, if other people along the way have parts of the files, uh, they can get them from there instead. Uh, and voice calls, of course, which uh, previously were called VoIP, but um, We'll get to that. We have a bit of a name conflict because we don't have any IP addresses anymore. So um, uh, also something that we'll cover. And on top of that, we have a new, AP, uh, a new web UI written in Ember.js, uh, which makes it much more maintainable um, and um, yeah, just smaller to work with. Um, but at the same time, because the lights are being weird, uh, because we have this API that people can build stuff on, uh, it is possible for other people or even for us to add other UIs as well. So if you wanted to build something that is specifically Android, you can do that. If you want to build something that's a text-based terminal application, you can do that. You just layer stuff on top. So to go down into the, I would say, interesting bit of the routing a little bit, um, this is sort of a, a slice, again, just lower. Uh, you have the service layer at the top, which with you know messaging, files sharing, et cetera, and you have this service API. And the, then you have this routing core. Um, it does a few things. It, um, it keeps a routing table, of course, which is something that we can't rely uh, on a kernel for us to do, because we might need root for that. So we need to replicate that functionality in our own code. Um, we also uh, collect some link heuristics about uh, package drop rate and, and TTL and a bunch of other stuff that can help us factor into what is a good connection, what is a bad connection. You might not want to send all of your packets just to the first person who can receive them if that person has a packet drop rate that's really high, and instead maybe take a longer route, which is much more sustainable. It also has a persistence module built in, which is uh, something that's important to us uh, for reasons that we'll get into. Um, but it, it basically just means that every packet that gets rooted can also be stored for some amount of time. It doesn't have to be rooted immediately. And just because something was delivered to a neighbor doesn't mean that that packet is lost. Underneath that, you have the network interfaces. Um, only two of those exist at the moment, or actually only two interfaces exist because we're still sort of early in development of this rewrite. But fundamentally, there's nothing stopping you from hooking this up to Tor or your local wireless mesh network like Freifunk or um, whatever. Um, the two ones that we really care about on, on Android are Bluetooth and Wi-Fi Direct, which are direct 
um, replacements for the ad hoc mode that we lost, which has been deprecated. And um, um, it's may maybe we can explain a bit uh, further. Um, the reasons we have so many possibilities to interconnect is um, that in uh, the first version we used what every uh, wireless community network um, is kind of using nowadays, so in a talk mode or, or Wi-Fi connections. And as this is not there anymore, the, the, the ad hoc mode is, is a beautiful mode where every device is kind of equally um, connected with the same routes, you don't have a, a router and uh, then followers. And um, with uh, other networking modes, we, we cannot replace it, but we can to try and go with as many connectivity possibilities that we have and use all the, the different pos possibilities or try to use all the different pos possibilities, which also kind of requests us to uh, abstract this layer. So what we have been working in the last two years was uh, also to, to get a con concept that allows us to abstract all those layers. So am I? OK, cool. Um, so to go back to the top, um, to go again top down, um, the service API is essentially the core library of call called libcall. And um, it's written in Rust. like almost everything in the project. Um, it provides you a few endpoints to interact with a system entirely in user space. It makes a few abstractions over platforms so that if you're on Android, if you're running on Android versus you're running on a Linux PC, uh, there's no real difference how you have to handle these things. It, it sort of gives you a framework to, to build an application on top without having to worry about the exact implementation of your platform. Um, it handles user authentication, uh, it handles messages, so things that you send into the network, it handles contact data um, where people can you know, make friends and assign trust levels and set nicknames and whatever. Um, and also it allows services, as I've mentioned, to interact with this library, register themselves and say, hi, I'm an application running here, please talk to me. The way that this looks in, in actual code. Uh, this is the initialization of a, an application running on CallNet. The thing that's missing there, which is the to-do, is it, this is not initializing any network modules. So uh, you're creating a router, and then you're not attaching anything to the router. So the router is going to get every packet and go, cool, I don't know what to do with that, and save it, I guess. Um, the, the router is. So you initialize everything from the bottom up. You initialize your network stack. Then you initialize the router. Then you initialize libcall, which is the call struct that is created there. Um, you can create users with this API. Uh, you can register a service, which in my case here is de space cookie my app. And then you can send a message. And sending messages is it has a few different modes that it can run in depending on if the recipient is a flood or a user or a group. So you can either address something to a single user or a group of users, or in this case, a flood, which is basically spread it into the network and any node that is existent on this network can get this message. The beauty of this is that if you have an application that you want to provide on this network and um, you don't know how many other people have this because it's not standard, you can send out an announcement like this with a flood and say, hi, by the way, I, run, I am running here. Can please people talk to me? Um, and then you can find other instances of your application find, uh, running on other people's devices uh, that can then you know, do whatever you want to do with it. Um, on the receiving end, that's it's pretty simple as well. Uh, I've skipped all the initialization step, but you just you have a listener function. Uh, there's also a poll, and we're also working on making things asynchronously, but it's sort of a rolling working version uh, where you can listen for this specific uh, service ID, and then every message that this node encounters on the network that is addressed to the service will get called with your code, and then you can do stuff with it. So um, that's the sort of top level application building process. Um, if we, then, then we get to the routing. Um, 
Again, we have to do routing in user space, um, and we are orienting ourselves with Batman, which is a routing protocol which uh, uses pheromones and uh, dist sort of a distance vector approach. Um, the, we are writing it in Rust, and I am bad with names, so I called it Ratman. Um, it also does a few other things, um, such as delay tolerance, which is uh, the DTN. What that means is that if you have two networks running in two physically distinct locations and you have people with bicycles, for example, crossing between location A and B, then if someone from A wants to talk to someone in B, the messages can be buffered on the person with a bike uh, for the duration of that trip, which is why the routing core has a persistence module. They have to be stored somewhere. It has to survive device power-offs and uh, potentially it has to stay there for weeks until either the message is surely delivered or it can be deleted because maybe a buffer has f filled up or, you know, we're not going to fill up a device just completely. There's a maximum size of stuff that we're going to save, but we're going to hold on to frames and packets as long as we possibly can. So some of the stuff that we've also been working on is um, simulating this. Um, this was actually a, a Google Summer of Pro Code project by someone um, who's now part of the core development team. Uh, her job was to figure out a way to uh, get a bunch of inputs and then create transform functions so that with relatively little work, we can uh, you know, have a bunch of events and then replicate those events in slightly different circumstances throughout the network so that the, the actual load on the, the machine simulating this can be low, whereas we can simulate a lot of network traffic. Um, this has been working pretty well. The networks that we've so far only simulated were like three or five devices connected with each other, um, but we don't really... Right now, the problem is that creating these networks is a bit of a manual task where you have to like hard code stuff that gets you know all the nodes and how they're connected. And once we build a thing that can auto-generate networks, the, this testing will be able to go much further. It doesn't replace actual physical testing, but this is a pretty good approach to test some assumptions in how we want to do routing and um, how certain mechanics are going to impact the link quality. Right. Yeah, to be able to um, navigate it easily and to support as many platforms as possible, uh, we again decided to go with a web GUI, um, which is an HTML5 GUI written in Ember.js, and to implement uh, the, the current paradigms of usability um, and to have much more responsiveness than we had before. So different layouts um, and possibilities for different uh, devices, but all within one HTML5 layout, which is then over a JSON API connected um, to uh, our um, application. Um, and there um, it, it uses um, then our um, API to communicate. It is beautifully documented, or should be at least. We <laughs> invest uh, quite a lot of time. Um, and you can also communicate with us. Um, we have a mailing list, and we also have an IRC channel, which are our main um, uh, community and also uh, developer communication um, interfaces. And we also try to have a weekly voice chat um, that you can approach if you are interested in it. So. That's our uh, development team at the moment. If you are interested, um, we would be really happy to in enlarge it and to have you join us. All right. Questions? Thank you so much for the talk, Katharina and Matthias. And now we ha hand over to some questions. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, can you say something about the scalability of your system? So, not at the moment. Um, 
we, we think that the scalability is going to be comparable to something that you can expect from a Batman network in Freifunk, for example. The routing algorithm that we take is very similar to it. So we, um, you know, people announce themselves on the network, and then you have a routing table just in user space instead of some kernel table. Um, we, we don't know. We, we can't say for sure yet, because we haven't built networks that are big enough yet. But on the other side, we're not making substantial changes to the algorithm that Batman uses to indicate that we might have scalability problems down the line. Next question here. Hi. Can you speak a bit, a bit about the choice of Rust and how that's been? Mm. So. Um, the, the previous application was entirely written in C, uh, C99 specifically. We were looking at uh, what we wanted out of a language. And one thing that we aim to do is run on certain routers um, with, that then don't provide a UI and that only become infrastructure nodes that know how to keep a routing table and how to process data. And um, so because of this, we were already looking at pretty low-level languages. And so basically, the question was, do we rewrite it in C with a better architecture? Do we rewrite it in C++? Or um, Rust was kind of new at the time when we sort of made that decision. It was a language that I started having quite a lot of experience with because I used it in a lot of personal projects. Um, at this point, I'm also on like a few Rust teams. and. I'm quite heavily involved in the community. Um, the initial decision was made because it is a much more modern language than C++. It gives you a lot of the same benefits. It has other benefits. It, of course, has some downsides. But we thought that because of the benefits that the language gave us, the downsides didn't seem so bad. So yeah. Hi, and thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, so I've been looking for a few months now into decentralized things in networks mesh like this. And I was just wondering, how would you compare this to, to other projects like libp2p, libp2p or GNUnet or other projects? Like why, I mean, I'm just wondering, is this, mm. some, yeah. why, why again? Um, okay, it's, I mean, it's in a way, it's not again. So when we started the project in uh, 2011, there was really nothing usable at all. So um, I never wanted to start an other project of anything, um, and um, yeah, since then uh, many projects uh, tried also to go in this path. It's a it's a very hard path, um, as most projects that also try to be decentralized or are decentralized um, are just internet overlay. So with um, integrating everything into one application from the infrastructure level from the really real network connectivity over the services over to uh, up to the user interface and the whole configuration of the system all this in one um, program is is really painful and I haven't seen an application kind of be really succeeding in, in that. So uh, one of the reasons we are rewriting that is that it was working really great uh, back in, in 2012 until 2014. And we, um, we were still working OK on desktop systems, but not on mobile systems anymore. And to have an application that is interconnected all those uh, devices together is unique and um, is not there at the moment. And we hope uh, we will be succeeding. We are also in, in constant contact with uh, other projects and also try to, to check what they are doing. And uh, most probably, um, we can share some of the things uh, because the, the the real um, uh, things at the bottom of it. So how do we really interconnect with it? Those problems are for, I guess, everyone the same. One, one thing to say there, um, I, I don't think we're really reinventing a lot of things. We're mostly looking at what other projects have learned over the last few years and then applying those uh, findings in a different context and seeing what we can come up with. Um, so. Uh, definitely, I would say without a lot of the other projects that have existed, like, for example, Serval's approach to uh, the delay tolerance and how to store messages and you know communicate changes in journals um, and uh, advances in just general routing like Batman and the derivatives that exist now. Um, without those, we would not be able to do what we do now. So it's very much a we're sort of succeeding or we're trying to be the successor of some of these ideas and see where they lead. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much again. Thanks for your uh, very interesting questions also. And um, now my question is, of course, uh, where can I find you during Congress if I want to contribute? I heard you have a workshop over there now, right? Right now we, we have a, a testing workshop where we are looking a bit more in, in the program, uh, where we are and can, can also find out a few things together. Um, and then we are sitting a lot at the EFRA and there are some other um, testing workshops uh, that I'm doing um, tomorrow and after tomorrow about decentralized networks, about uh, networking protocols. Okay, so I find that, of course, in the far plan. So uh, 6.30, you find um, them in the workshop area. And um, if there's not more questions, I have a tiny thing for you. You can now choose whether you want some mate or some chocolate as a tiny gift of the Open Infrastructure Orbit for you as a thank you. I haven't you. slept yet, so I'll take the mate. Okay, perfect. <laughs> you want some chocolate? Or yes, please. <laughs> so... Thank you this very much. This is for you. Thank you for having the talk here.